To explore suicide among justice impacted people and the health, trauma, and training implications for corrections professionals, I'm joined today by an extraordinary group of panelists. First, I'd like to welcome Gerard W. Bryant, PhD and Director of Counseling Services Wellness Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Gerard, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Next, I'd like to welcome Dana Mueller. Dana is a case manager with the Colorado Department of Corrections. Dana, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Up next, I'd like to welcome Andy Potter. Andy is founder of One Voice United. Andy, welcome. Thanks for having me. And I'd also like to welcome Stefan Walker. Stefan is Director of Correctional Health at the California Correctional Peace Officers Association. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. So with that, uh, Andy, I want to start with you and get, we heard a little bit uh, giving us a glimpse into what life is like for corrections officers specifically, but what is it about this profession that the general public misunderstands and just does not know? You know, I would say first you have to start off by saying, you know, most people in the United States are fascinated with law enforcement and corrections, but for the wrong reasons. If you turn on many channels on your television and others will show a lot to do with corrections, the shields, people being harmed, things happening that are traumatizing. Uh, and to be frankly honest with you, that's not the people that I know and work with. They came into this profession because it was a way into the middle class and they wanted to be able to do something good for somebody while they were in that position. And I think there's a narrative, uh, we call it the Shawshank Redemption narrative, uh, that just really paints us as being a bad guy in this. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, not, that's not the accurate uh, picture at all. Well, Stefan, I'm wondering if you could also elaborate on that a little bit more. I mean, I do think that it's important to bring up that for the general public, the only interaction that we have with anything related to corrections is through Hollywood and the media. So from your take, what is it that people are not fully understanding? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, I believe there are dynamics that are embedded in the design of the system that people don't account for its impact on the officers. That pain, that punishment, that separation, officers aren't immune from that. We simply take it in smaller doses. So I, I think people don't understand that when you walk into this setting, that fear, that uncertainty, that lack of personal security, our uniforms don't immune us from that. And in most cases, officers end up internalizing this and they don't share it with their families and their friends because it's not something the general public understands. And when you start talking about it, People, as Andy pointed out, people are initially fascinated, but then the 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 inhumanity of it, the 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 disgust of it, begins to to well up, and they start unconsciously pushing away. So, and we are trained to recognize those subtle little things of humanity so we stop talking about it so I, I i think that's the one of the primary dynamics that people don't understand is that we're not immune to what happens in these settings simply because we're employed paid and wear a uniform dana i'm wondering because as i mentioned in the intro you are uh, a case manager when Stefan mentioned the humanity of working in uh, jails or in the prison system, 
it might sound like an incredibly uh, thoughtless and glib question, but people might be wondering, well, wait a second, that's what the job is. Um, what is it that should be improved so that this isn't the kind of job where the wear and tear on the person being asked to do it is so egregious that it leaves people in these hopeless places? You could probably talk for days about that. Um, but for one, uh, the culture, the culture in corrections is one that dehumanizes um, staff members. And I just want to run back a little bit on the initial question. I agree with everything that Steph Stefan and Andy said, but I would add that one major thing that the public should be aware of is I think I, I think the consensus among uh, corrections employees is that the public is so unaware of of the reality behind the walls and the fact that 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 we even exist. Um, I was talking to a um, she's a case manager now, but had been a lieutenant and she was brutally assaulted back in April and she's still recovering from that. And she was talking, we were talking about the public and her, and I've heard it more than once, the public, the, the feeling is that the public doesn't even care. So when you talk about what to change, um, one thing is just recognition, recognition that uh, about what's really happening. The silence needs to stop, the, the secrecy. Uh, corrections is a whole nother world that, um, that turns everything that, everything that really is abnormal, trauma, um, dehumanization, everything that is abnormal becomes normal in that environment. And you, you don't even realize that, that you're um, internalizing that until, if you ever do, until years later. So for one, the, the culture, the public needs to recognize that there's a huge, um, that there is a correlation between crime and corrections. So recidivism is, is more crime, more victims, and it's, we need more attention, um, funding, and recognition. And it starts with these kinds of conversations. Well, Gerard, building off of uh, what we just heard, I guess my question then would be uh, the way, again, that most of the public, if they think about prison system or corrections at all, it's a way to sort of, it's pushed out of one's mind. It's like, okay, so you did a bad thing. You are going here. Um, there's people who will deal with you and society doesn't have to anymore. First of all, is that a fair assessment from your standpoint? Absolutely. And to piggyback off of what has been shared by all these wonderful professionals here, um, you know, the media has unfortunately portrayed correctional workers, and I'll, I'll use the term workers, uh -huh. um, as uh, people who are hardened, who have no feelings, who have no empathy, um, you know, when in fact, and we heard it in the video where a family member, you know, committed suicide after 20 plus years of service. And, you know, the fact is that the officers and workers that are in those are people just like everybody else. And uh, you're right that that there is almost the, uh, you know, th that we're robots that work inside, and in fact, uh, we're not, and we're faced with people with acute and chronic stressors on a daily basis. And it was alluded to, and again, in some of the video where people talked about seeing and, and Stefan talking about what he saw on a daily basis. Not to mention the fact that just the the work itself, the shift work. Uh, being separated from your family, maybe having to do overtime, uh, some facilities, sometimes doing triples. Uh, it, it just is a recipe for disaster. Well, then I'm wondering if there is, I mean, uh, I guess a way to reevaluate it, because I've heard a couple people bring up the importance of funding. And we see uh, at a time, at least, that for a lot of states, funding for prisons gets uh, cut, or perhaps they're run by a private organization, which doesn't necessarily provide the correct funding, which seems to add to. So Andy, from your perspective, I mean, is this something that uh, money can be thrown at, or is this much deeper? Well, I do, I do think when it comes to funding, 
we should be thinking about corrections and the investment in the human life. And that investment comes up front in training and better conditions and uh, things like that. They cost money and you can't take money here and put it somewhere else. That's where we, that's how we got here is defunding this system instead of revamping it and reinvesting into it the way we should. That's that point. And uh, I think when it comes to how we view corrections, uh, it's a system that wasn't designed for success to begin with. And I don't think when you take money out of something, we've seen that. Stefan and I both, 30 years I worked in an institution and watched it be defunded. And I've watched how that has an effect on those who live there and those who work there. So I don't think that's a recipe for success at all. I think investment in better training, uh, having treatment programs, wellness training, career advancements. We've seen a crisis across the United States in corrections when it comes to staffing. And if you can't have safe mm -hmm. staffing, you can't have safe facilities for people to even think about reimagining their life. So, Stefan, I mean, of course, since Andy brought you up, but also uh, sort of the same question. I mean, again, I think of other documentaries that I've seen about the prison system or recent stories that we've heard about how some prisons have been so defunded that they, while they are in warm parts of the country, they can't afford air conditioning. And so it gets sweltering hot in there. Yes, people might think of, oh, that's bad for the prisoners, but that's got to also be bad for the staff as well. Absolutely. Look, we have facilities in near the Arizona border, uh, California, Arizona border, where the temperature reaches uh, externally upwards of 115 degrees. Now you have to factor in that these officers are also wearing stab resistant vests. They're wearing polyester or cotton overalls, uniforms, um, and, and then 15 pounds of equipment in some cases. So again, back to that initial point that people don't factor that the environment of corrections doesn't care whether you're wearing a uniform or you're wearing, you know, overalls or, 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 you know, prison blues. It, it, it's, it, it's indifferent to how it impacts humanity. And that's the component you're going to continuously hear me bringing up is humanity. There are people in these environments. And when you take funding away from things that produce positivity, you already have an environment that, that is saturated in negativity. It's designed to foment pain. It's designed to foment discomfort. And when you eliminate because of budgetary cuts, you eliminate those services and programs that that instill value that that eat up that empty time and space. It's it's just like any other um, biological experiment. You take something organic and place it in a dark, damp, hot environment, and it's going to metastasize. And, and that's what we're ending up with is that officers are, and Andy brought it up as far, as far as the training goes, continuing career education needs to be a foundational component of an officer's training and education. We're talking about people. We're talking about humanity. We're talking about psych psychiatry, psychology, but I'll leave that to the other two panelists to cover. Um, but we're, we're hired, and this is my last point, is one of the things that we are not, or the system doesn't do a good job of evaluating what does and what does not work. So what they miss is the things that we do as officers 
that aren't part of our job description to ensure a smooth operating unit, institution, yard, and we don't get recognition for that. And I'll stop it there. Well, first of all, I uh, thank you for that comment because I think that was very powerful in helping us get a better understanding. I also want to remind the audience that while this is uh, a very, I would say, dense um, and perhaps surprising subject that we are discussing, please feel free to send in any questions that you would like me to ask our panelists. But in the meantime, Dana, I want to turn to you and I guess sort of ask because while we're hearing about uh, you know, the challenges and what is needed, unfortunately, there is still a part of the public that feels as though everything about prison and jail should be often. That's what makes it a deterrent. And so with that being the prevailing belief for, again, people who have no experience with a loved one or personally in this system, what would you say to that thinking that like it's supposed to be awful? I would say that it doesn't work in the big picture. Um, if you are focused on making an awful punitive environment that that only increases the trauma for the staff that have to work there. It also increases the likelihood that um, you're going to have more incidents with the incarcerated individuals, more assaults, more riots, um, just more, more escalation in general. And not only that, um, a, a, a large majority of those people are going to be back out, back in your community, your neighbor. Um, so the focus needs to be on providing opportunity for rehabilitation, not not just uh, not just caged. You know, it's supposed to be corrections, not um, like I said, caged. So that would be my response to that. I think there needs to be um, a balance where. Colorado's made some progress in, in going more of the direction of changing the culture as far as using um, communication uh, with the incarcerated population, um, de-escalation techniques, those sort of things. But at the same time, they're leaving it, the staff behind in that transformation, meaning nothing's changed with the culture as far as how they're how they don't, how they do treat staff, or we're we're actually in the middle of a staffing crisis to the point where I'm I'm a case manager, but I'm required to work as a correctional officer twice a week for two different shifts because we simply don't have enough officers to even minimally staff the facilities. Well, that's an excellent point. And that, of course, is something that seems to be coming up in so many of the institutions that perhaps we as Americans have taken for granted. Gerard, do you see there being a possible breaking point of some sort where because there isn't enough staffing, because the conditions for working are so subpar and so stressful for not just individuals working in the systems, but also their families, do you see this as being a problem for even being able to maintain our corrections system? Now, um, great question. And, and I love the comments, but the uh, panelists, uh, there's so much to, to think about and respond to. Uh, but to your question, uh, I've, I've worked in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for 22 years and staffing was uh, always an issue. Uh, I'm still involved in the periphery and um, belong to a community relations board and go to meetings. And the warden that uh, was there was begging and pleading with us uh, to about the staffing crisis. And you say breaking point. Yeah, at some point, if you don't have enough staff and the staff are overworked and overburdened, uh, it is going to cause problems. Uh, you hope not to this point of full scale riots and things like that. But, you know, just uh, little things like body fluids being thrown at people and, you know, just a lot of behavior on the part of the inmates that are, you know, come about because of the lack of funding. And I want to talk about that for a moment, too, because mm -hmm. your, your initial question was about funding. And I think, and I know the Bureau of Prisons has done this and, and other systems, but we need to pay as much attention to suicide prevention and wellness to staff as we do to the inmates. 
And, you know, they're all human beings, both the inmates and the staff. And, you know, having an employee assistance program, educating staff, letting them know. I think Stefan talked about, you know, not sharing feelings. That is one of the biggest problems that you have with, with staff not feeling comfortable in coming forward. I think we've grown a lot of society and people are starting to feel more comfortable to ask for help. But we need to make environments more user friendly when it comes to mental health services, both from the people who are incarcerated and those who work in in those facilities. Now, the other thing I'll add is that we need to also be sensitive and work with administrators who have come up many times to the system, maybe not, and to, for them to be sensitive to the needs of, of workers who are there, um, you know, making them work overtime or tell them they can't go to a wedding or, you know, that just breeds more and more resentment and resentment, as we know, leads to health problems and things, you know, and worse. So, uh, and I, I, there was a little flag that came up there in the video, the life expectancy of a correctional officer is 59 years. Uh, that's true. And I'll just add one, one other point. When I worked in corrections and I would stand in the lobby and we'd have other law enforcement folks come in like the US Marshals or the FBI, the one thing many of them would say is, you know what, I can't do this job. I could not be in here. So that tells you when other law enforcement are telling you they couldn't do this, you tell it tells you how dire this environment can be for people who work in there 24 hours a day. Stefan, I just want to bring you back and ask just your thoughts on the staffing crisis. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone has touched on this point, and I think that what we're going to be faced with in a very short period of time is that we're going to run out of people that are interested in entering this environment in the way it exists. Um, we're having in, we're having agencies across the nation lower their standards. They're altering the messaging that, especially here in California, they they created a new PR campaign that talks about being instilling hope and inspiring change. And the reality is, when when people come into this environment with the expectation of being able to help someone and being part of a change, they're going to be disillusioned and they're going to walk away because this newer generation, younger generation are less inclined for whatever reason to continue to stay in a situation that they find uncomfortable and un unsatisfactory or unfulfilling. And that's one of the components I think that someone raised the issue of our CCPOA's Berkeley survey um, that where we talked, uh, we surveyed over 8,000 correctional officers responded out of our 28,000 and over 58% said they would entertain leaving this occupation at a moment's notice if they could receive equal compensation and benefits. That's more than half of your workforce. There's 20% that says that they would stay unconditionally. So there's that's 80 something per 80% of people that find something about this job unsatis unsatisfying. So we're going to have a problem. And that's nationally. I'm sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. And Andy, I was wondering um, your thoughts, because a lot of the, you know, the issues that I'm hearing come up and the needs that are, exist within corrections work in general do echo some of the uh, crisis and needs that I have heard from other professions that deal with, you know, extreme situations. And so what would you say to perhaps part of the public that's saying, wait a second, why are these individuals getting um, the support that I can't get in my civilian life and I don't come in contact with uh, the corrections 
industry, I'm not industry, but the corrections uh, business at all. Yeah, I, you know, Dana touched on this earlier. Uh, we have to remember that anyone who's incarcerated, there's a great many of them that are going to come home and, and they're going to be your neighbor. And so we should invest in their lives while they're incarcerated. So when they get out, they can be as productive as they possibly can and set them up for success. And when it comes to the, the staff who work there, and the front, including administrators, by the way, uh, we shouldn't leave out that there, you know, there's a lot of politics that go into how decisions are made as well. And when it comes to the budget, so we should touch on that at some point, but the investments that can be made uh, in those that work there are only going to make them healthier. And you, when you have a sick, hurt workforce, they are not going to be able to perform and and take on the kinds of changes and reforms that they're being asked to take on. Can you imagine working 24 hours straight and then someone says, hey, by the way, we're going to change a policy and we want you to go and work with uh, a certain number of those folks incarcerated uh, for another four hours on anger management or something. They don't have the capacity. They don't have that within them because the system just taxes them out. I think when you invest in when administrators, politicians and unions should really collaborate and along with local practitioners about how to make it healthier and safer. Dana, I'm wondering, I mean, for Americans, and I want to be very clear that for us in this country, the idea of creating a correctional system that ha is an environment that not only can people get well in, but people want to work in, can feel somewhat foreign, I guess. But from your perspective, first of all, is that possible? Because there have been examples in other countries where they seem to be able to uh, create something like that while still holding someone accountable for the crime they committed. I definitely think it's possible. Um, I think that it starts, but I, I do understand that the public that's another misperception, though, from the public that when you when you work inside of behind those walls, mm -hmm. you see a completely different perspective. So um, as far as actually, I would like to pass this one over to to Andy, if he's ready to talk a little bit about um, we did a whole trip to uh, Norway with one voice, and I think he might be able to answer that. By all but, means, Andy, please. Yeah, can you reframe the question for me again? Basically, I was asking that the idea of creating uh, a correction system that is a place that A, people want to work in, and B, is a place where people, while being held accountable for their crimes, can still become better citizens, can seem foreign in the way that we've practiced uh, prisons in America. But in other countries, it seems at least that they've been able to attempt to do something like that and that it seems to be working. But I would ask one of the experts if you know if that's correct or not. I think, you know, I've been to Norway uh, a couple of different times. I've been to some other Scandinavian prisons as well and have gotten to see how they operate. A couple of things with that. I and mean, we've tried a lot of Norway uh, techniques here in America, and I think some of them will work. Uh, Aside from the fact that our societies are so much different, I said in the opening of the program mm -hmm. that America is fascinated with it for the wrong reasons. And when you talk about humanity and dignity, that's first and foremost in a place like Norway and other places. And, and we go about it because the like someone should be punished every day of their life mentality. And where in Norway and other Scandinavian countries, the freedom itself is the punishment that's taken away. But if we practice dynamic security, if we went about it in a way that changed the narrative about what we were doing in there, why we were doing it, and what the end result could possibly be, if we really reimagined and we brought those frontline workers in, as a stakeholder, an equal stakeholder, the two largest stakeholders, by the way, are those incarcerated and those who work there. Mm -hmm. and those who work there have been left out of the reform conversation since day one. 
we're 10 years behind now trying to catch up and realizing that we won't be able to realize those reforms unless they are intricately involved because we're inextricably linked. The conditions someone lives in are the conditions someone works in. If we can improve that and improve when they get out, what resources someone has when they get out, because a lot of us here have seen a revolving door. And most of that is because there's no support uh, given at all. Interesting. You know, while we talk about support and uh, investments that need to be made, Gerard, I'm also wondering um, if we just talk dollars, like is there any such thing as a department of wellness in the corrections facilities? Yeah, and, and I saw a question here by one of the uh, participants uh, that asked about it, whether or not there is budgets for staff wellness. And in my experience in the Bureau of Prisons, it was an interesting sort of evolution. When I first started, um, the psychologists, the mental health staff were actually designated as the EAP providers. Uh, so staff were told we could also, they could come to us, which presented a lot of, as you can imagine, conflict of interest. So they slowly, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to clear for everybody. What does EAP stand for? Stand for Employee Assistance Program. Okay, sorry. cool. <laughs> right. Thank you. I've always been on that. Uh, but Employee Assistance Program, so we could be their provider. But of course, you know, you're working side by side with people who are sharing things that you may or may not want to know. So the Bureau of Prisons did something very smart. They started they a, started a contract with an outside agency, Federal Occupational Health, that was advertised by all of, by the psychology department, others to say, you can have it. So to answer that question, we had a budget and we have a budget and the Federal Bureau of Prisons does have a budget for a wellness uh, program outside of the institution. On top of that, there are also the staff, the psychology mental health staff, does it dedicate some of their time during annual refresher training, which someone spoke about not having that, it's really important to have that every year where we stand up and talk about mental health services that are available, things to look for, what are signs in post-traumatic stress, you know, all these things. Um, so yes, we do, in the Bureau of Prisons, I can't speak for other states or localities, but there was a budget and is a budget dedicated to staff wellness efforts. Well, you know, are any of these uh, cultural changes that all of you are rightly suggesting, are they even possible without, uh, you know, various different prison administrations buying into them? And I'm just wondering, you know, is that something that even is feasible or is there pushback considering budgets and, of course, how this might look in politics, which does play a role in every decision that we make? And so... Dana, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Yes, I can. Um, so when we're talking about cultural change, it, it does, as already has been mentioned, it, it does have to start with employees and how, how the culture of corrections treats employees or even listens or allows them to be heard. So corrections has, for a, for a very long time, had a par it has a paramilitary structure. Um, and what goes along with that is that there's very little empathy on the ground from maybe not all, but many managers towards towards employees. And to change that, it does have to come from the top down. And I, I don't know, for one, before you can even really get to that point, the staffing crisis has to be addressed. And that goes back to creating an environment where people actually want to work. And part of that, it all is um, interlinked because people prefer to work in a place where they feel valued. So when it when we get into talking about changing um, administration and the values and the culture coming from that level, I, I as far as changing it, I think it has to start with, with uh, public pressure. I think that may be part of what's, and, and things like this to open up the conversation and bring it out into the forefront. Um, maybe it even needs to come from governors, higher level um, leaders that are able to impress upon the administration that this needs to change. This needs to change three, three, um, the average of three officers 
taking their own life every week across the country is just, it's beyond, it's heart wrenching and soul crushing. And it, and if we don't act on this, in my mind, it's, it's blood on everyone's hands. Interesting. You know, Stefan, I'm wondering, um, at least in California, what are, if any, the uh, services that are at least being offered now to uh, corrections officers? Actually, we have undertaken a extensive um, advocacy effort in California that has augmented the services that are provided. But I'd like to backtrack just a second. Mm -hmm. We're assuming that we know by developing these programs what we're solving for. And Ooh. that's where we're making the most fundamental mistake, I believe, in, in wasted resources and also waste of human life. We don't know what the true issue is. I, I mean, we we know the environment is the nexus to all of these officers losing their lives to the increased alcoholism, the increased substance abuse, the increased discipline. But do we fundamentally understand what is it that we need to change? Because right now what we're doing is band-aiding. We're, we're responding to the, the manifestations of something that we do not fully understand why it's doing what it's doing. And it, as I said, we're <clears throat> wasting resources. In 2000, and I'm going to get this wrong, uh, at 15 or 14, we presented a proposal to our governor to begin a, a, a holistic, broad band study in order to begin to identify what the problem was. And what it ultimately ended in was our Department of Finance saying, oh, this is going to cost too much money. We're going to end up having to hire a bunch of new officers and cut down the number of hours that officers can be exposed to this environment. So we just need you to offer us some immediate things that we can put in place. We're here today with augmented external services, uh, augmented some augmented internal services. But again, we're putting ointment on a skin rash without understanding what the internal cause is. Um, that's a very uh, amazing way of putting it. I think we can all visualize that. But Andy, does that fit with what at least your understanding is um, in some of the Midwest states like Michigan? Absolutely. I, you, when we talk about the stresses, post-traumatic stress disorder, correction staff have uh, on average 34.1% stress level where police have 12 to 20 and the general population has 3.5%. That's on average. That's a very high stress level. We know depression Corrections officers are 31% versus police 12, general population 9.1. Uh, I think there's, Stefan's right. And remember, this is a reoccurring thing day in and day out. Now, now Michigan does have a great, uh, has a great system in place. And when you look at places like Norway, the staffing levels are like 10 to one instead of here where we're 100, 200 to one. And the training is much different. Two years of it with peer to peer in Norway. We're here, you're lucky to get 16, uh, 16 weeks if you're lucky. Uh, so it's across the Midwest, it's around the United States and I would go one step further. This is a global problem. This is not just afflicting here in America. It isn't just a Michigan problem, not a California or Colorado problem. This is a global issue. So, uh, and until we start to change the environment and we start to understand and recognize, as Stefan alluded to, that the, what the root causes, and we come together to fix that, we're going to continue down the same road. On average, 157 corrections officers in the United States commit suicide. 
versus 11 on average, 11 to 15 die from uh, causes that are directly related to the work they do. That's staggering. That's a, that's a that's a crisis. Dana, I'm also wondering uh, how do you see at least um, the culture from administration and the way that they view staff as uh, not just um, a large organism, just staff, but as individuals. Yeah. Um, uh, management, the, in, again, this is from what I understand and what I've conversations with, with other correction staff, this is a nationwide and like Andy mentioned, global problem. It's not just one state. So just a couple quick examples. I was talking to a um, sergeant the other day and he was telling me how a few years back they had a incarcerated person jump off the third tier. It was a successful suicide. And he ended up, he was part of that and had to witness that. And he had to work another, they needed him to stay over. So I think he worked another eight hours something like that. So for 16 hours and the response he received from management at that point was more like, it sucks to be you. I mean, and, and that's the kind of thing there's little things like much less extreme, but things like that go on every day from the officer that had to call in sick. This person has tons of sick time and he calls in sick because his daughter's very ill and he gets a frustrated sigh from the lieutenant and she hangs up on him. I mean, that's the kind of, you are a body, you're, you're not an individual and that, that needs to change because all of that contributes. If you're not feeling valued, I was thinking that, that when we watched the very first clip that staff go through the same dilemma of not feeling valued or that we matter. Of course. Well, I guess then with all of this, to bring it back to uh, how this affects the entire country. Um, Dana, you of course mentioned several times, and I think all of you have that, uh, not only do incarcerated people, they do come back out of prison, but also that uh, corrections officers are also part of our communities as well. What is it, and I'll ask pose this question to the entire uh, panel here, that seems to be something that the public, the general public can do to help provide support? If it's community organizations, if it's, um, I don't know, some sort of like, if it's donating, I'm not really even sure what that might be, but what is it that at least the public can do while we wait for the mechanisms of bureaucracy to start to move? And Gerard, I'll start with you. Sure, uh, I just wanted to address one thing and then talk mm -hmm. to that question. Um, you know, getting the administration to buy in uh, to changing the culture. One of the things that, you know, when we talk about dollars, uh, it, uh, having a successful completed suicide uh, costs a lot of money, uh, you know, with, with impending lawsuits and things like that. And if you get an administrator to understand, administration to understand by hiring more staff, by doing more training, you're actually in the long run saving that institution and the taxpayer a lot of money by doing those simple things rather than facing million dollars of lawsuits for liability and all kinds of things. That's the fallout when you have suicides. But back to your question, what can community do? I think awareness is one thing and having uh, webinars like this to uh, change the perception of the public, attempt to start to change the perception of the public about what correctional officers do is really important. There are a lot of support uh, groups out there, NAMI. I mean, there's a whole host of communities uh, that have these organizations that can actually come in and work not only with the um, justice impacted people, but also the correctional staff. So I think, a, uh, I know it's a very simplistic answer, but definitely awareness is where it starts. Okay, and Andy, your thoughts, same question? Yeah, I think that's right. It's gonna take a collaborative effort, I think. Uh, number one, to find exactly what the root issue is. Uh, and when you find the root issue for those who are working there, you're going to find the root issue for those who are living in there, those who are incarcerated, because we're inextricably linked. And I think it's going to take a collaborative effort. It's going to take changing the environment 
revamping the culture, bringing humanity and dignity back into a situation where it wasn't designed to have it to begin with. And I think it's going to take community. They're going to have, we're going to have to reset the narrative. Uh, and we're going to have to make sure that the community and others have readily available programming for when someone gets out of uh, prison and when someone retires and someone that's going in day in and day out with that reoccurring stress because you can't cure. This is afflicted. This is an injury. And you can't fix that when someone's reoccurring that every single day of their life. They work in there. Stefan and I both did it for 30 years. It's not you know, you won't cure it otherwise. Stefan, um, your thoughts? <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I think um, Mr. Bryant, uh, Dr. Bryant and Andy have touched on this. Um, and Mindy, look, there's a, the only way we're going to solve this is together and we're going to have to hold the electeds accountable for the change that they continually espouse during campaign season mm -hmm. and these budgets for corrections we need to know what does and does not work i i think the public is already there they, the Pew study that's dated now, but one in 100 people have someone that has been under supervision. The public understands and, and is destigmatizing every day having been engaged by this system, but they need to expand that out to understand that the system also screens out bad actors uh, in officer capacity. So the, the thing that's causing the, the harm, the hurt, the violence is the system and we need to work together to change that. Dana, I'm gonna give you the last word before we have to go. Oh, okay, I think we lost Dana. Well, unfortunately, I'm now looking at the clock and realizing that we have run out of time. So unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up, but I do want to thank all of my panelists, uh, Stefan, Andy, Dana, who unfortunately we lost, and Gerard. But seriously, thank you all for being here with us and sharing your incredible knowledge. And on behalf of 13 and John Jay College, I want to thank you, our audience, for being here with us.